So in my community and tradition, we begin any talk by just saying, Dear Thai, Dear Sangha. Thai being the Vietnamese word for teacher. Um, so I'm specifically calling to my teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh, but it's also an invocation of all the teachers and students and teachers all the way back to the time of the Buddha, remembering that this is a stream of transmission of teachings that have been handed down, spiritual friend to spiritual friend, for thousands of years, and what a privilege it is to be part of this stream. Um, I also like to recognize and honor that we all have probably many traditions and lineages that we carry, and they're all welcome. I'll be speaking from the Buddhist tradition, um, but that by no means needs to exclude any, anything else. Um, and we all also have teachers within ourselves, and we're all students on this path, so I honor the teachers and the students in all of us as we begin this time of reflection. I also want to honor the Lenape um, First Nations people who are the original stewards of this land, who, whose spirits allow us to be here even if it was by force most of the time, and who still exist um, in, this, in these areas. So um, in my tradition, we speak of ancestors coming through our genetic blood ancestors, through our cultures and the land, and also through our spiritual traditions. So Dear Thai, Dear Sangha is a welcoming of all of our ancestors. Mm. I wanted to talk about hindrances tonight. Um, it's a topic that I really enjoy, even, <laughs> though, even though the experience of hindrances often isn't all that pleasant, <laughs> but the teachings on them bring so much freedom, I get excited about it. Um, so we'll explore the hindrances. I'll explore the hindrances for a while and then we'll open up to questions, reflections, sharings on this topic. Um, has anyone not heard the term hindrances in a Buddhist context? Fantastic. I was going to explain it anyways. I'll be sure to be thorough. Um, the Buddha had many lists. If you haven't noticed that before, let me say it again. There are a lot of lists in this tradition. Um, things that are numbered was, was an easy way for people to remember teachings that were all passed down orally. Um, and coming into uh, the teachings of the Buddha or the Dharma, um, I know I was really a little overwhelmed by all the lists and numbers when I first arrived. So you don't have to remember this if that feels a little too much, but I'm just going to go over. Um, it's said that there are five hindrances to a concentration, to collecting the mind into a space of tranquility and a wakefulness. Um, it's mentioned in many different suttas. Um, and so the first is sensual desire, wanting, wanting something that feels good to any of the senses, to uh, a wanting a pleasant sound or sight or taste or smell or physical sensation um, is one way of, of looking at um, sense pleasures. Um, and then there's aversion, not liking something, often sense-based. <laughs> so those, this, this initial like desiring something or pushing something away, not liking it, are the first two of the hindrances. And then there's, I think there are kind of just subtle refinements, are a sloth and torpor, or like a drowsiness, whether it's actually sleepiness or just a, a sluggishness, a dullness of mind, it makes it very hard to awaken. And then restlessness and remorse or an agitation and anxiety that also makes it really hard to settle. Um, and then what's said as the fifth hindrance is doubt. And I can tell you this whole year I've had a deep exploration into doubt and really um, <laughs> it was at first very painful and now becoming much more liberatory. And I used to just think it meant um, reading a Buddha, a teaching from the Buddha and then actively thinking, I don't believe that. 
I didn't experience that that often, so I didn't think that I experienced doubt, but it's much more pervasive. It's the, oh gosh, it's the, the subtle like, oh, I'm not sure about that, or maybe I should check out 20 different things before I settle on one technique. I've done that. Um, it's, it's this um, uncertainty, this... Um, and in, in a way, it, it tends to carry, there's some aversion there, there's some desire there, there's some restlessness, and there can be some sloth <laughs> there. Um, but it is named in and of itself. And there's all sorts of traditional teachings around. Uh, one I really like is images of water, because um, in the Buddhist time, there were, I don't know if there were any mirrors, or they were very rare. So people would have a bowl of water to look in to, to, to see the reflections check how their hair was doing and <laughs> that kind of stuff. Um, the monastics probably didn't do that too much, um, but it's the image that the Buddha gave. And so um, craving or the, the sense desires um, is said to be like dye in water. It taints your perception of everything you experience. It tints it. Um, you, you, you see what's going on, but it's, it's, it's been altered. Um, and then um, aversion is said to be like boiling water. I mean, you just have like no clarity of perception if the surface of the water is boiling. It's splashing, it's like all over the place. And, and when we're in the midst of like really strong hatred, our mind is like it's, it's boiling. Our capacity to perceive things clearly is really altered. Um, sleepiness or the sloth and torpor, uh, sluggishness is said to be like water <laughs> that's covered over with moss and algae, like it's a stagnant pool and it's just, I mean, it's just thick. You can't see through it. Um, nothing moves. With too much energy, it's like water that's been blown by the wind. And so again, the surface is rough and there's just no way to see down as to what's, what's really going on in there. And then doubt is my favorite. It's like water that's been stirred up and it's muddy and it's been put into a dark closet. <laughs> <laughs> so like even if you could have light in it, it's muddy. But like you can't even see that it's muddied. There's so many layers of uh, inability to have clear perception when we're stuck in doubt. And I certainly know that doubt often just feels like reality. I think they all feel like a reality in the moment. We don't even realize our perception is, is unclear. Um, and I find sometimes just the reminder of Perception is not clear here. <laughs> I think I can see what's happening at the bottom, but actually, if there's any of these states present, I'm not seeing clearly. Um, and to just let it be kind of simple, um, with all the lists and the teachings and the metaphors and similes, um, some people, like, they grasp onto it and they know how to use it right away. And that's amazing. And I was never one of those practitioners. <laughs> I'd be like, what do you do with it? I don't, what, what does it mean? Because I, I, I have a mind that can find 20 or 50 interpretations of anything. And so that, I didn't realize that that was part of my doubt experience because I say, well, does it mean this or does it mean that? Does it mean that? I don't know. Um, and so I approach a lot of the teachings I found that learning to approach them through the body gives me a lot more clarity than trying to have my mind analyze my mind and try to find um, clarity there. So I found it's really helpful to get to know what this, even a subtle pinch of sensual desire feels like. The mind will go off in stories, but the body often kind of, for me, it tenses up and it might kind of lean forward. Um, there's some sort of like grasping, right? Because I want something to be different. And I notice with um, 
aversion or ill will, there's kind of sometimes like a, a pushing out sense in the body. And sometimes even in the muscles in the head will have this like frown, you know, <laughs> like st even in sitting meditation, there'll just be this tension that starts to take over the head. It's not always the same, but I've started to notice a pattern of physical sensations that manifest when the mind is in this state. Um, sleepiness, sloth and torpor, I mean, if there's the actual nodding off, it's kind of quite obvious once the nodding off has happened. Um, but I also for years thought that the primary hindrance I experienced in sitting meditation was restlessness and remorse because there was so much thinking going on in the mind. And it was only two years ago, thanks to a good teacher I sat with, where she said, you know, you talk about all this activity in the mind, but it sounds very calm. In fact, it sounds more like sloth and torpor um, because the energy level is just, is just low. You know, there's this sort of drifting and then coming back and drifting. And that's not a restless energy. And when she talked about getting in touch with the energy of this drifting, I realized, oh, that's true. Often what I thought of as restlessness was actually sloth and torpor because I could feel it in the body and then I could recognize it. Whereas restlessness and remorse, like um, a form of anxiety or it has also a lot of thinking often, but the body is agitated. It might not be leaning out or pushing away, um, but there's if I really tune in, there's almost this inner trembling or like, oh, what about this one? Well, why didn't I do that? Um, I think of it as this just small tremors. Um, and doubt I've just had to get to know as often a combination of everything. <laughs> um, so I want you to think back to the meditation we just did might anyone here have experienced a hindrance or two? <laughs> or 3,000? <laughs> Can anyone remember a moment, perhaps, of, um, of sensual desire, like maybe wanting your body to feel more comfortable, or maybe some hunger arises, and you're like, oh, I can't believe I didn't eat more. Can anyone, um, yes. Do you, can you remember what that felt like in the body when you experienced that thought? Yeah, I was trying to kind of like breathe them in and just imagine it like leaving my body, but it wasn't really working because I still like felt my legs, you know, kind of going a little, you know, tingly. Yeah. So like I would have to move and it was kind of like I would break concentration a little bit and I'd try and get back yeah. into the whole like imagine the water and like the river flowing and flying. Yeah. And I wonder if there's any other part in the body that might have also kind of seized up in reaction to that discomfort. Oh, yeah. yeah, so it spreads beyond the actual spot, right? Mm -hmm. And you, there's probably a variation on that for everyone here. Um, but I want you to really, yeah, experience. What does that actually feel like? Not just the discomfort in the body, but the rest of the, the mind, body, stream going, oh, I want it to be different. <laughs> um, does anyone have a memory of a moment that there was aversion came up, not liking it, so wanting something to change, which yeah. they're all kind of interrelated. So we're breaking it down, but they're all connected. My hip was hurting really, mm -hmm. really bad. <clears throat> but um, eventually when you were just saying to breathe, I breathed into my hip and it like kind of went away. But then it kept on coming back. <laughs> and it hurt really bad, but um, yeah. Can when it hurt really bad, like if you think, like, was there a maybe a tightening or something in the head or the arms or the torso or the legs beyond just the actual painful part, but sort of a reaction to the pain in the body? Does that make sense? Like a gripping in my jaw. Okay, so you notice a gripping in your jaw. So that's a really tangible way to notice the like, oh, don't like it, want it to change. 
And that's what's going on. Not to judge it or, or to try and even make that go away, but just to know a bit more clearly seeing this is what's happening right now. Thank you. Did anyone notice any sloth and torpor, any drifting? <laughs> well, hopefully that, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> One person at least, <laughs> thank you. And, and so asking you like, how did you notice that in your body? Does that bring up anything? It was interesting because I was rewarding myself, thinking I was meditating so well, and then I realized, <laughs> wait, am I falling asleep? <laughs> and my head went back and my neck became stiff. So then I Where'd it go? So yeah. It was a chain, a chain reaction. <laughs> Thank you very much. Did anyone notice restlessness or remorse, uh, like anxiety or uh, that sort of shaking? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've just been having nightmares like every oh, night, so sorry to hear I haven't that. been sleeping. So I just kept thinking, I hope I sleep good tonight. Yeah, <laughs> totally. And then I was like, bring my thoughts back. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Oh, that's Which really is, hard. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, my body was kind of kind of can become intense and my shoulders and mm -hmm. stuff and yeah 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 that's it's a rough rough journey mm -hmm. yeah but thank you for so much for sharing that sure. yeah. <laughs> did anyone notice doubt one of the simplest ways doubt shows up in sitting meditation is am I doing this right mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> did anyone notice anything like that Yes, thank you. I mean, um, because my mind kept going left, right, up, down, and I'm like, okay, am I doing this right? Mm -hmm. Because I'm not focused, I guess. So it's kind of like, I must be doing this wrong. I gotta get this right. It's important for me to get this right. <laughs> <laughs> but my mind kept going to, okay, I gotta answer these calls tomorrow at work. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah, that's so real. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, so um, I want to tie this into Mara, the Buddha's embodiment that sometimes is called like the Buddhist devil, and that's a totally inaccurate way to think of this. It's, it's an embodiment <laughs> or a personification, really, of all the hindrances. That's that's one way that I, I find it's helpful for me to understand Mara. And all the stories where there is someone meditating in the forest and they're about to attain enlightenment, which was the case for the Buddha and others, and then Mara comes and tries to tempt him and 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 brings up doubt and brings in all these afflict these hindrances. And the moment the practitioner says, Mara, I see you. And then Mara turns away and you know goes off and kind of pouts or you know that's that's it that's all it takes to defeat mara to defeat the hindrances is to go oh i see you this is what's happening oh hi doubt that's what's going on right now hi aversion <laughs> that's what's happening and suddenly the water of seeing into this mind stream gets clearer. It might not be completely 100% forever clear, but in that moment, you got a moment of clarity. And that's beautiful. And I used to beat myself up. I think a lot of meditators, when we start practicing, and even after we've started practicing <laughs> long into our past, we find moments or long stretches where noticing hindrances feels like we're doing something wrong. It feels like there's a problem. It feels like there is a deficiency. And yet, the teaching just says, see it. And in seeing this, what's happening, we have a moment of freedom. And I heard that so many times, <laughs> probably hundreds. And then at one point, it just clicked like, oh, it really isn't a problem. The hindrances are only hindrances when we believe them and when we're stuck in them. 
and they have sway. And the moment they're seen for what they are, we're freed from them. It's so simple, it's not always easy. Um, I think this teaching is so important, not only for the experience on the cushion, but I mean, these hindrances show up in all of our lives. You're having a conversation with someone, you start to get agitated, you want things to go differently, it gets tense, this conversation goes south, you get into an argument, you don't know why. <laughs> and if there's a capacity to go, oh, restlessness and remorse is happening right now, I see you. Maybe I don't need to follow you. It might prevent arguments or change how we're able to show up at work, change how we're able to show up in our communities. Um, like it, it's actually not any different from how we are um, in the rest of our life. It's a lot harder to notice them, these hindrances arising when we're in interactions with other people. So it's really helpful when we're in a formal practice <laughs> to, get, to get good at noticing them. And that's why I find it so helpful to get to know how they show up in the physicality, in the, the physiological experience, the sensations. Because when I'm in the middle of a conversation or, you know, writing a bunch of emails, I'm like, I just want to get this done, I just want to get this done. And then I go, wait a minute, I'm just so tense, what's going on? Oh, aversion to writing emails. Okay. I don't actually need to continue in this way. I can still keep doing the emails in a little bit quickly, but like I don't need to be doing them like this. And my brain doesn't notice because it just feels like trying to rush through emails just seems like the reality of how one does emails. That's my, how my brain takes it. But my body at some point will kick and go, this doesn't feel good. <laughs> Wait a minute, this isn't necessary. And so um, not everyone is so kinesthetic in their practice, but um, for those folks who are, I think everyone has a little bit of this. Um, and for those who have a lot more, I like sharing this physical approach to getting to know these teachings on how does it show up in your body and then let your body just start just tapping you on the shoulder or tapping you on, on the noggin and, and saying, wait a minute, what's going on? And then there can be this moment of clear seeing. Um, it's really quite remarkable because it's not easy, but it really is simple. Um, there's a lovely phrase, if it's in the way, it is the way. <laughs> and I find that's really appropriate with hindrances in particular because it's just so easy to feel like, oh, if only I wasn't agitated, then my mind can settle. But that attitude of, oh, if only this would go away, that's what keeps it in place. And these moments of like, oh, it's agitation. Maybe agitation isn't a problem. I'm just going to experience agitation. Sometimes it just makes for easier experience of agitation, but other times the agitation suddenly isn't there to be explored anymore. Just as I, I find, as I'm just actually getting interested in like, wow, what does this aversion feel like? It's, it's really neat. Like there's, there's burning in my belly and, <laughs> and, and there's like, waves of sensation in my right shoulder is just so interesting and when I'm genuinely interested it often disappears <laughs> um, but if I'm exploring it to make it go away then it just stays so this whole befriending the hindrances is such a revolutionary um, practice and approach um, it, it can change so much not just the sitting practice experience but it can change a lot in sitting practice as well so it's it's just it's so so precious um, another quote I really like uh, Suzuki Roshi uh, founder of the San Francisco Zen Center oh, I love this phrase you try and you try and you fail and then you go deeper which is kind of brutal <laughs> um, because there are times where you just try a little bit and there is some sort of progression. But I found, <laughs> someone was asking earlier, you know, is there times where practice is difficult? I was like, oh, we're getting a whole talk about it tonight. Um, there, th that, that effort of like, try, try, try. 
and then coming to see like, oh, Mara, I see you. To get to that point of saying, Mara, I see you, hindrances, I see you. There are often parts of our psyche, for lack of a better word, that get really attached with and identified with like, oh no, I'm a good person, I don't have ill will. Mm -hmm. Or like, I know how to be calm, there can't be agitation in my meditation. Um, or I have all this faith, like I don't experience doubt. And if when those mind states, which we usually can't see, that's what holds them in place. So don't worry about it, the whole point is to see. When those are in play, there, need, there might come a point where it's like, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. I fail completely. And that, it's a painful experience. Um, but it's necessary to then open space. Oh, now I see reality more clearly. And that's a gift. Um, sometimes that's the path we need to go down to then really see Mara and then really find a bit of freedom from Mara or more freedom from Mara. The final bit that I wanted to add um, that I've heard a few teachers talk about but it's not from the traditional commentaries. Each hindrance has a traditional antidote. Um, I'm not going to add another list. Um, but the antidote for aversion is to cultivate kindness. Um, and I've found that most of my experience of hindrances in meditation and in the rest of life have this second layer of hindrance, which is an aversion to having a hindrance arise. Um, it's like, oh gosh, I can't believe I'm drowsy. I don't want to be drowsy like I tried to get enough sleep and here I am in the hall and uh, aversion to the sloth and torpor, aversion to the doubt. Um, your second layer or third layer might be something else, but I know a lot of people where it's some form of aversion or self-judgment. Um, and beyond just kindness, I find that compassion and self-compassion, which we're going to explore on Sunday or Saturday, the whole day, um, has become an essential tool. If it's if it's a if it's sort of a lighter hindrance, and it's like just the moment of like I see you, Mara. It drops away. Fantastic, amazing, wonderful. And then there are all the other hindrances that like I see you, and it's stuck. Um, and part of that stuckness uh, can be some sort of emotional pattern that's not been felt. And the moment of going, taking a, a uh, don't want the microphone, taking a pause of like, is there pain here that I'm not taking care of? Is there a hurt that's, or some sort of distress that's keeping this agitation going, that's keeping this desire going, at, at which, you know, like, even pain in the legs or something while in sitting meditation, it's easy for the mind to jump to like, oh, I wish it didn't hurt, versus actually letting ourselves feel, oh, this, this hurts. I'm just gonna let myself feel that hurt and may there be freedom from this discomfort. Or the cycles of doubt may have very, very deep roots. I mean, for me this year was finding how my dad's death in a car accident when I was eight was showing up as a source of doubt in all sorts of other places um, and on a long retreat there was a few weeks of really excruciating emotional pain but in meeting and say okay this is painful may I feel it and may it be released after a few weeks tremendous release came that allowed doubt in all the other parts of my life and I won't get into that long story but like that pause of like wait a minute is there a pain here that's not being felt that's holding this in place and sometimes I put my hand on my heart <laughs> I know some teachers who who introduced a like hand on the cheek like oh this is hard oh, this is hard to see hmm. and then maybe looking at another step um, can also be really transformative for the stuff that's more stuck. Um, 
And it doesn't mean that we have to do make a big deal about it in our minds or big gestures, but just this little pause from the habitual, like, oh, I wish it would just go away, to like, oh, this is hard. That's why it, it keeps coming up. Oh, relaxing into it. And then looking in to see what is there to be seen. Um, I don't often hear talk about that, but I've seen phenomenal change in my own practice, and I know enough people who've also had deep, um, deep insights from bringing compassion, kindness, caring about suffering, because it's so easy to try to skip over suffering. Our nervous systems are hardwired to do that, you know? <laughs> Um, we come by it uh, by good measure. But it leaves us with a lot of mental and emotional suffering, so it's also worthwhile to learn a different pattern, and it's possible. It's really possible. So befriending hindrances is an invitation that I just I send you all out with. Um, whatever that means, please play with it. You know, it doesn't have to be serious and heavy, like, oh, I wonder if it's possible to be friends with this moment of hatred <laughs> or pain. Hmm. Tara Brock uses the phrase um, inviting Mara to tea. I always like that image. It's so absurd. <laughs> I imagine like an English tea set, you know, and like Mara, come on, have a cup of tea, Mara. And it just like confuses Mara. It confuses the hindrance because they're so used to being pushed away. <laughs> Wait a minute. Friendliness? I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> um, so those are some reflections. And I thank you for participating and offering stories. And I want to open up the space, whether it's for comments of your own experiences. Maybe you have a whole different way of working with hindrances. Or maybe this has brought some insights into experiences you've had. Maybe you have questions. Um, so if you can make a gesture, a bow, or a hand, or something to let us know that you want to speak, and then we'll listen. Um, and please make that gesture again when you're done so that we can know that you're done and no one will interrupt. And even if you're pointing questions to me and someone else wants to, to, to go next, um, we, can, we can just hear from folks before um, responses come. And we have about 20 minutes, yeah. So the floor is open. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So I don't know if this is an appropriate question. <laughs> How long does it take to get your mind um, to stay focused? Is this something that um, meditation is something that my doctors have suggested mm. to me. I've had five strokes. Oh my goodness. So, um, the fifth one being seven months ago. So they're like, you have to do something. Yeah. I'm like, okay, but I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do. Yeah. So my sister suggested on Monday me coming here with her. Mm. I did. And she couldn't come tonight, but I said, I'm coming with her without you. Mm. Without you. Oh. So I'm here. Yeah. So I just want to know how long does it how do you go about getting rid of all these stuff <laughs> <laughs> that, that could be, you know, I don't feel stressed or anything, mm -hmm. but obviously it's something because yeah. I've had five strokes. Yeah. Um, so how do I get to that point? I wish I had a simple answer. <laughs> um, I've been meditating for 15 years and I still have thoughts all the time, but they're a lot quieter, and they don't. And I, I don't hate them like I used to. Um, I, and I think there's some people who have very different experiences, and and that that goal of like, oh, I have to change, that like, that's what starts to shift. It's like the attitude starts to change. Um, that's it. I don't know if you have class. Are there classes here sometimes in meditation or? Think some folks, you know, I I jumped into doing retreats because I found I had tried for a few months to like practice at home by myself, and I had I I didn't follow through. I didn't feel like I knew what I was doing, um, 
and I kind of have an intense personality, so I was happy to jump into like a, a seven-day retreat, a 10-day silent retreat, um, meditating 12 hours a day. That was, that was, for me was easier than trying to like do a 10 minutes a day at home. <laughs> other people, um, other people not, they have very different pathways. So um, I would just wanna share that like any, any steps are worthwhile, whatever the result is. Um, and the results we see in the moment rarely have anything to do with the cumulative effect of the practice because every time the mind gets reframed, gets turned towards less reactivity, towards seeing things more clearly, towards letting go a little bit more, it, it creates the capacity for it to happen again. Um, but it's so subtle that if we're looking for results, it's very easy to get discouraged. Um, and I would suggest, do you live nearby? Yeah, not far. That's awesome. So I would suggest you maybe finding a time to talk to Bonte or the Ayas and, and, um, or look at if there's a program that might work for you. Um, so, so patience and perseverance are the really the best boat. <laughs> um, and we're all in this together. We're all facing similar issues. They just don't become, over time, they just aren't problems anymore. <laughs> um, I really wish you well. You. Yeah. 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 I um, wasn't experiencing thoughts so much as colors and textures. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if that's a hindrance or to be expected or the objective. depends <laughs> yeah um, there are some variations of experience where some sounds and some lights do appear when the mind is totally still but um, people often also just think and process in different ways some people have a lot more words in their minds some people have more images some people have more like inner hearing um, I don't know classically, but so when I say thoughts arising and passing, it's not just words. It can be, for me, I think of thoughts also as like seeing a scene play out or imagining something or, you know, earworms, <laughs> hearing songs play, that sort of thing. They're all variations because they're all generated from the mind consciousness. Um, but it, it, yeah, it's just, you know, like, okay, that's what's happening come back. Good. <laughs> you're smiling. And it's nice just to be able to smile to yourself and to your experience. So mm -hmm. that just that drop of that word twice made an incredible difference. So thank you. So glad. Thank you for that reflection. Um, my teacher Thich Nhat Han, I mean most of his instructions on meditation are like smile and breathe. Um, <laughs> or like enjoy feeling like a flower and like a mountain and I must admit um, so, like I heard that day in and day out I lived in the monastery for six years um, I practiced for eight before that and I'm still practicing and for all the times I heard that gentleness every year or two I would find this layer of like whoa I thought that I was meeting my experience with kindness but there's this huge swath of violence that I'm inflicting in my mind oh okay now I see this I let it go and then two years later or a few months later oh my gosh I found another layer of like really intense violence in my mind towards my mind and then 
a few years later, <laughs> like, oh, I thought that I was being really non-judgmental, but I found a subtler layer of aversion and violence. And then a few years, like I have, I think of it as an endless onion. Um, I do. I do feel like I had a really big breakthrough this fall <laughs> and maybe I'm coming closer to not having aversion and violence towards um, the experience in my mind. Um, so I, I intentionally repeat kindness a lot because I, I think I'm not the only one. Um, and I heard it for years. But that hardwiring of like, gotta be better, gotta do it right, if it's wrong there's a problem. Uh, it was so intense, and I'm not much of a perfectionist in many ways. And I didn't. Most of my life, I've been like a really chipper person, really optimistic. Like I didn't think that I had this intense negativity in my mind. But practiced enough sitting meditation, and like, oh, there it is. Because we're all conditioned by everything around us. So of course we're going to seep in some of the stuff in society that we don't think we're absorbing, that we don't want to take on. We all take on parts of it. We all pass on parts of it, even if we don't want to. So, so this work of, of befriending hindrances, of getting patient and persistent with cultivating wholesome states of mind, of a bit more calm, a bit more peace, it's not just for an individual experience it cannot help but radiate into our environment and have effect in our relationships in our communities um, in the institutions that we're part of it's really the medicine our world needs um, so even just like taking time this evening to practice and maybe continuing like that's precious that's worth honoring it's worth doing, and it's worth finding a way to do it that you enjoy and that you'll continue, <laughs> as opposed to like feeling obliged to do it because, I mean, yeah, it's great that doctors are saying you should do this, but like we also want to find an inner motivation. <laughs> um, start tasting the, the beauty of it because it will bring up suffering, but it will also grow joy. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, it sounds to me like you are saying this attitude of befriending the hindrances that the goal is not to make them go away but rather not to be disturbed by them yeah. so in, in, in noticing that they appear then essentially you're not trying to make them go away because it's okay it's okay if they come if you're not disturbed by them and even if you're disturbed by them it's okay if you notice that you're disturbed by them and then you're not disturbed by that. Totally. So at some point it stops, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think of it like those Russian dolls. Like, if I can't accept the core doll, well, can I accept that I can't accept the anger I'm feeling right now? And if I can't accept that, can I be okay with not being able to feel okay about not being able to feel okay about anger? And at some point I find a big enough container it's like, oh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's so hard to understand with the rational mind. It's like, what? Direct path. No. <laughs> but yeah, it's that change. Because ultimately, these are all variations of suffering or dukkha or dissatisfaction. or I've been using the term bumpiness um, because the term comes from the whole of a wheel the axle hole and it's like an unpleasant hole of the wheel so if you imagine like riding in an ox cart that's bumpy that's kind of that's one of the etymological roots of the word um, so I, I like using bumpy um, it's not a classical translation at all <laughs> um, but these are all variations of how we experience some dissatisfaction some suffering and the Buddhist teachings are that there is suffering in life. There's bumpiness and rockiness, and you can practice all of these things and transform your experience. And there's still going to be death. There's still going to be sickness. There's still... I'd like to think that there wouldn't be oppression, and I think if we all practice this beautifully, we would cut a lot of social oppression. 
Um, but there's still going to be difficulties. There's still going to be hardships. But if we learn to meet them and they aren't a problem anymore, we're free wherever we are, no matter what's happening. And we don't have to wait until there's the big bang, no suffering forever. Um, each moment that we drop the hindrances and we meet reality without making it a problem is a moment of freedom. And that's my understanding of one of the most important teachings of the Third Noble Truth of that, that, that suffering has a cessation, there's a cessation of it. We can train ourselves to notice those moments. So it's not just noticing the hindrances and letting them cease, but also notice when joy arises. Notice when there are no hindrances present. What's that like? What does that feel like in your body? What happens in the mind when there's no craving for something to be different? And there's no pushing away something we don't like. And there's no drowsiness, and there's no agitation, and there's no doubt. What does that feel like? Notice it. Let it grow. It's worthy. It's beautiful. And everyone has the capacity for it. Most of the time, we're experiencing little moments of it, but we miss it. So it's not far off. It's not just for certain people. It's not just for the afterlife. It's right now. Check your experience. And so the times that it feels more complicated and difficult, it's okay. We have these tools for how to practice with it. But we also have the teachings and tools to go, okay, wait a minute. It's also this very moment. <laughs> I can drop into a moment of non-clinging, a moment of non-hating, a moment of non-delusion. And I can experience that. is possible if we're alive we're capable of it <laughs> and the Buddha invites us all the great teachers I think all the great wisdom teachers and the sages and the saints I think they're all just finding the language and pathways that they know or that they discover to invite us into this space of, it's like you, I think of it as sort of getting into the quantum level of experience. Yeah, there's, there's the atoms and molecules, but if you look really deeply, there's just so much space between all of whatever our thoughts and emotions and experiences. There's this vast space that's right here. You don't have to go anywhere else. It just looks so deeply that you touch the reality of the whole universe by exploring the breath by exploring the pain in the knee, by exploring the ache in the heart when someone dies with curiosity, by letting rage burn willingly and being willing to learn from it and see what's underneath the rage is the pain that's too great to bear and suddenly it becomes okay to bear it and then it becomes space and it coexists we don't have to get outside of the realm of the problems and challenges if we go so so deeply into whatever our experience is we can find that we call it the ultimate dimension Really, we can.
your voice is so beautiful and <laughs> transcendent <laughs> and um, it was a wonderful meditation and just wanted to know um, and thank you for the reminder that metta is all over the place and <laughs> so thank you for that mm. We have uh, maybe two or three more minutes for this open space. If anyone is feeling something tingling that's arising and wanting to be shared, uh, we would love to hear from you. And if there isn't any more, that's okay too. Maybe we're satiated. <laughs> yeah, there's been a lot. So please take home whatever resonates. Let it work below the, the thinking level. Just let it, let it sink in and let the rest go. Let it flow on <laughs> with the rest of the thoughts and emotions. Um, and yeah, if you're inspired, I hope you come back to programs here. If you want to come on Saturday, we'd love to see you. Um, or any of the retreats and classes. There's just so much here. It's really such an amazing offering. Like. Yeah, whenever I'm at a, like a really rich Dharma center, the folks there are like, oh yeah, it's pretty great. I'm like, you probably have no idea how rare this is. <laughs> that's okay, but you know, if you want to just like take a moment and get in touch with that, wow, this is amazing. It can be really nice. <laughs> and this, I think this place is one of these, wow, this is so amazing. It's so unique. Um, and it's so unique to have interest in Dharma. Most folks just aren't interested. <laughs> um, and so to also like, the Buddha talks about recollecting um, the goodness of our generosity, the goodness of our morality. And I think even the goodness of being interested in Dharma, like that's, that's worthy <laughs> of letting our hearts grow a little stronger of like, yeah, there's this goodness here. Um, so thank you so much for, yeah. Did Can you want to? Mm -hmm. It's more of a practical question about mm -hmm. Saturday. Because mm -hmm. um, it's an all day thing. If we can't come the whole day or if we have to leave and come back or something like that, is that like an issue? Or <laughs> what does Buddhist insights have to say? <laughs> what? I, yeah, let's. Okay, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll stop. Uh -huh. the